I, I like to make one recommendation on that. Uh, whether you choose to do planned or unplanned drills, it's always a good idea to contact your local, whether it be the school police department or the actual dispatch of the police department that's in your area. And advise them that you're going to be running a drill that day, roughly what time it's going to be done. That way, if you do get the erroneous instructor or student or somebody that you know calls out to a parent that something's going on, law enforcement is already prepared. They've already advised the officers in the field that this is a practice drill. Okay, just one recommendation for us. Yeah. Yes. Let me, let me just add one other thing. I think for all of you school people, the most important thing to keep in mind for you is it's not the response. The response has been described. This will be done very, very capably by law enforcement. They will come and they will do what they do. For you, it's all about the preparation. The preparation is really what's under your control. So if something happens, if people are feeling comfortable, I know what to do, I know why it's important not to panic, I know where to go, that's the, that's the kind of thing that you can control and that's where the, that's where the practice comes in. And, and really getting feedback from your people, be they teachers or school secretaries, uh, are we doing this well? Are you comfortable with the way we're doing it? I think that's, that's the preparation that will really, really make it work for you if something, if something happens. And, and as Superintendent Gordon said, uh, you know, I want to I want to also go back and re reiterate. Um, really, we really, really strongly recommend that because now the law allows you to remove that piece out of your comprehensive safe school plan. Do it. That, that that's really important. And and the education code is in the slide on on your handout, so you'll know where that. If you haven't done it already, I don't want to insult folks that have already done it, but you know that's we see that as as huge. So. Um, and, and again, lastly, I just want to conclude by this is kind of the way we train. And um, and again, you know, you don't want Sergeant Wynn or these folks necessarily educating your kids, but just allow us to do what we need to do and help take care of you until the incident's done. And we'll give it back to you and even help you along the way with reunification and things like that that we are able to do with the manpower that we have. And we, and we believe we'll have plenty of officers there to help you. Um, but understand that uh, we will give it back. And uh, I never really wanted to be a teacher. Um, but, um, you know, you can have your school back and, and, we'll, and we will leave it as best we can. Tony. Uh, I've worked in both Elk Grove and El San Juan Unified. Large, uh, large number of campuses, very old, and multiple access points mm -hmm. from any which way. So the debate going on right now that I'm getting a lot of phone calls is say schools manager, lock doors or not? Yes. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. Are you saying as far as the response to law enforcement? Or is it on a daily basis? Daily policy. Teaching with door yeah, lock, that, I think, is what's important. Here's, here's, here's your dilemma. I'll, I'll get it up with you, Randy. And, you know, we do this for a living in both worlds. And here, here's your dilemma is lock the school door. You tell people to lock the school door. Still, educational institutions, elementary schools, high school, middle schools, are just like active shooters. They're dynamic in nature. You lock the door, but you can have uh, your holiday gathering out in the quad, and all the doors are locked. I don't think that any of us in this room, unless anybody wants to answer, that, we have the answers sure. to what happens when a horrific event may happen at your school. I think what we know and what we see is that you as school <coughs> leaders, you as superintendents, if you can bring safety to the forefront of, if, of your people's eyes, that it will allow your, our schools to be less vulnerable to violent occurrences. Less vulnerable. But shopping malls, workplace, soft targets are vulnerable to people that are going to do bad things. What we try to do today, for the most part, is show you what we do. These people train us. These people train us to come in and eliminate or bring that threat to an end. <clears throat> and what we've tried to give you to the best of our ability is some <clears throat> tools to help us with all of the aftermath and the planning beforehand that might prevent it and have the person go someplace else. 
to do what the craziness they're going to do. Whether they be a student, whether they be a parent, whether they be a random person that has no attachment to your school. That's the best we can offer. We give you some tools. The flip chart, nothing more than section one of your safe school huge plan, right? The huge plan, 19 components, bullying. We do one, guidelines. How do you get guidelines? The guidelines. These guidelines, word for word, are in your safe school plan. We didn't. Safe school plan, word for word. Open up for the public, open up for a teacher. That's your guideline. Tactical response, if it's in there, take it out. We recommend it. But that's the best, uh, that's the best we can offer. And I, and I wish we could answer all those questions for <coughs> everybody that says all these suggestions, lock, don't lock, gates, don't lock, gates, unlock, don't lock. The problem is th these are the most dynamic, dangerous, and chaotic events you could ever be involved in. And unfortunately, we can't put the information in one side and, and have it, the computer spit out an algorithm that gives us the answer on the other side. They're all different. And unfortunately, yes, ma'am. The, the question is, is there an organization that comes out and gives suggestions to school sites? I think what you're going to... Yeah, you'll, you'll find the, the actual initiation of the emergency action plan is actually a requirement of, of <coughs> you folk right here in this room. That is your responsibility. It is our responsibility for the response mm -hmm. side from the law enforcement component of it. We will definitely come in and share with you that response and help you fine-tune it, but we can't come in and write your plan. You know, but we will definitely come and help fine tune it and help integrate that law enforcement response on the back side. I think what you're going to find post Sandy Hook again, like we did, <coughs> like we saw after Columbine, is you're going to see a lot of people offering you services in terms of consultation and extensively looking through your plans and giving recommendations. It's probably going to be a private sector component. Certainly would involve people with prior law enforcement, emergency response experience, things like that. So, uh, but as you can imagine, with how many schools in the county of Sacramento. Uh, it would almost be impossible for the Sheriff's Department to go in there and do that thorough of a job for each and every one of you, unfortunately. Uh, as I was saying is, unfortunately, you can't just put the information in and have the computer spit out an answer because uh, these incidents evolve. They evolve for several reasons. They've evolved over time just in terms of weapons and capabilities and things like that. They've evolved because of our response to the incidents. They've also evolved because, as Rich said earlier, alluded to the fact that these suspects study one another. They learn from one another. They learn what worked. They learn what didn't work. They talk about the mistakes. They talk about the things they could do differently. You know, you look at uh, you know some early some early instances back in Paducah. Seven and nine year old kids pulled the fire alarm to get the kids to go out and basically create the density for their victims. Put them on the field where there was no protection, no cover, no concealment, and then they could take them off like that. In, in Virginia Tech, the suspect brought his own <coughs> instrumentalities to block and barricade and chain the doors so they couldn't escape. So they do study, they do learn from one another, and they do evolve. Subsequently, we too must uh, occasionally look at our emergency action plans and our response to, uh, tactics to make sure that we're evolving with them. You know, although uh, the suggestion is that you do a comprehensive review of your EAPs at least every three years, I'm going to tell you, and I'm sure Lieutenant Jones would, would agree, that you guys should probably be looking at them internally, whether a discussion, a tabletop, or a full-blown test or evaluation of your plan, at least every year, preferably at the beginning, so you can make sure that every teacher or everybody that's on your campus, internally and externally, is familiar with your plans. That, that's your teachers, your administrators, your executives, your facilities people, whoever control your, you know, your, your buildings and, and your systems and all your plans. Uh, if you have a human resources or counseling components, all of those people are on board. And then externally, us, law enforcement, uh, fire. Uh, our emergency services personnel, our counselors, people like that. So again, these, I can't overemphasize the importance of, of at least occasionally testing yourself in, in the form of some kind of action plan or, or test where you can actually, one, put your emergency action plan to use, see how it works, highlight things that went well, right? Validate some of the plans you have in place or validate some of our law enforcement response tactics. Identify some areas for improvement or some responses in your, or gaps in your response plan or your, or your emergency action plan so we can fix those so the lessons learned. And then the most important part is the follow-up to make sure that the lessons you learned from that incident were actually implemented. Because oftentimes what we see is lessons learned and never change. So it's important that we do that. You know, a couple of things that came up, I made some notes when we were talking. Again, I think, again, this whole 
uh, conference here is really to get your juices flowing or get you thinking about the things that you could be doing internally. Again, the discussion and the, the renewal or the refreshing of the relationships between the school districts and the law enforcement component is really important. But what we really want you to do is pull those plans out, look at them, update them as necessary. Again, uh, you know, test them if you can, but uh, update the MOUs, make sure those plans are in place, and then give you some ideas for future training. Training you could do for your, for your teachers. What, again, what does law enforcement look like when we respond to these incidents? We could be coming from all over. Uh, as we know since Columbine, your initial first responder law enforcement is going to be the officers in that particular area, district, or division. They could be patrol officers dressed like me today. They could be detectives in plain clothes. They could be undercover officers thrown on a raid jersey. What will they be armed with? Handguns, rifles, shotguns, shields, who knows? So you've got to be prepared for that. What do gunshots sound like? Are you mentally, physically, and emotionally prepared for what you could see? The bloodshed, the carnage, the death, the injured children. What are we as law enforcement professionals going to do? We're used to going and helping bleeding kids in an active shooter situation. Unfortunately, we're not going to do that. We're going to run by them, even though they're clinging to our legs, until we can be certain that the threat's been mitigated. Okay. After that, we're going to go into our rescue mode. Um, and then also, the, probably for you guys, I think the biggest headache is going to be notification and reunification, as Rich alluded to in this slide show presentation. And then also the diversion of all the parents going to the school when you really need them to go to the new location, wherever that is, off-site. Generally not going to be something pre-identified because, as you can imagine, if these bad guys are learning from our response plans, if they know where our reunification is, there's going to be a component to address that as well, right? So um, another thing I was thinking about, what does a suspect look like? You know, it's, it's really hard to give you the absolute, but what we can tell you statistically is that 97% of these bad guys are male. The bulk of them are going to be between 13 and 20 years old. Uh, you know, we've had them as young as seven, uh, but generally speaking, they're going to be 13 to 15 block was about 38 percent. The 15 to 18 block was 30 something percent. And now with the college instance, we're actually getting a, a, the, that third category, that 19 to 23 range is growing a little bit. So it constantly changes. But generally male, generally between 13 and 20 years old, uh, almost always had some uh, connection to the school, whether they're currently a student or were a former student. And again, we're specifically talking about school violence. So when we talk active shooters, we have a whole other component of workplace violence. That runs the gamut of people pissed off because they got terminated, or maybe their wife or a husband's having an affair uh, at the place. So that's a whole different thing we deal with. But in terms of school place violence, particularly for you guys, that's the information um, that we can tell you. Almost all of them had some, uh, made some comment to a friend, an acquaintance, a sibling, or a family member that this was going to occur. Again, we talked about the planning and research that goes into it ahead of time. These aren't spontaneous events. Um, they put a lot of effort, 90 some odd percent of these people, 93 percent of these people are planning the events. Again, doing the research on the internet. Um, almost all of them had some, some connection to mental health professionals in the past, whether it was counseling. We know that a lot of the suspects are broken homes. Uh, so a lot of these people were uh, having or displaying some issues and went to counseling for one reason or another. Again, does that help you out a lot? I don't know. You know? Not all of these people that fit this mold are active shooter suspects, but most of them look kind of like that. So the hard part is really differentiating that category from these people, if that makes sense. It, you know, it Rick, is. One, one, of the most, me, Rick, one of the most significant challenges you guys are going to have as administrators of your districts is taking information from the teachers that's coming via the students. You know, Johnny next to me has, has made some you know, statements about having a gun or wanting to bring a gun to school, or bring a knife to school, or he's mad at you know, so-and-so, whether it be in person or whether it be through some sort of social media. And that's the biggest wildfire to have out there, that social media link. Because not only do the students grab onto it, but so do parents and, and other concerned citizens. And it just runs through your community and, and with fever. Um, it, it's going to be a challenge to look at each of those and say, is this credible? Do I, how far do I need to follow this up on? Minimally, you know, the, it, it should go up through the principal of that individual school. It should be brought to the attention of that principal. And then whether or not it goes into a safe school program if you have one, or whether it goes up to the district pass to be on that and then involves law enforcement outside. But please don't just dismiss them randomly. Give them the credibility and leave, uh, at least enough to look at to determine is there a threat there. We will come in and help with that risk assessment, you know, that, with that threat assessment overall and determine whether or not this student actually poses a viable risk in your school. You know, law enforcement is challenged with doing that. But uh, you know, as we talked about these EAPs beginning of the year, I challenge every school, please, within the first week, at furthest from the first month, at the beginning of every school year, pull that EAP out. Go over the safety programs with all of the staff on that campus when that first month, or probably that first week. Get it done, get it accomplished, look at it, make sure everybody understands roles, responsibilities. 
is we don't always have the time to choose our leaders. And we don't always know how people are going to react. But once you know a plan, once you have an idea of what your responsibility is, what your job task is in an emergency, you're more likely to respond and act appropriately than not. If they have that plan or problem, at least they have an idea of what to do. I'd rather have them do something you know, incorrectly towards the right goal than incorrectly with no guidance whatsoever. You know, they're just going to be a, you know, a, a blockade versus an aid. You know. so the importance of planning is the process. You know what I mean? So at least if you get it out and you do it and you discuss it, that's the important part. And lastly, as we transition to mental health, because that's what we're going to transition to the aftermath, is that as Lieutenant Jones made our introduction, <coughs> he's the second lieutenant sheriff from the largest law enforcement agency in the county. We want to tell you also, on behalf of school districts, I don't want to leave. We challenge you. But at the same time, we're all here, including Dr. Ladd, to say we are large school districts. We're here to help you. If you're a small school district, you don't have to do this alone, and we'll come. We will come to help when it's happening. We will come to help when it's happening, especially when you worry about that evacuation, reunification, getting kids back to parents, that is critical, because you can move on from there. You can't do that. We, 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 don't, we, we can't move forward, even in the mental health aspect. So we want to leave you also, because we're here to help you if you're a small school district, when it's happening that day, we've got great mutual aid support. Randy, just call, please call. Command folks will call. We'll come. We'll come help.